halfway to go. Okay, it's already a recording. Okay. Okay, I can start now. Um, good afternoon, all participants, and also good morning for Florian, the speakers, and good afternoon for lecturers and also alumni that join this guest lecture. Welcome to the serial guest lecture today. Um, that are held by architecture department, Petra Christian University, Surabaya. That today we have a lecture entitled Learning from Small Scale Adaptation in Everyday Architectures in a Time of Crisis from Mr. Florian Kosa. And particularly today, uh, today guest lecture is hosted by Studio Merancang Tuju or Seventh Semester Studio. And yeah, my name is Ruli, and I will be the host for this guest lecture and also the moderator. Uh, we have Mr. Florian Kosak here who would share his, his expertise in architecture and urban design. Currently, he is a senior lecturer in School of Architecture in the University of Sheffield, United Kingdom for urban history, theory, and design. And I will read through his short CV. He studied architecture at the Technical University Berlin and continued to the University of Strathclyde, United Kingdom, and then to Edinburgh College of Art, United Kingdom. He also co-founded two workers' cooperative GLAS or Glasgow Letters on Architecture and Space in 2001. One of his research projects in progress is RAUM or RAUM is about researching architecture as an urban method. It is to rethink the capacities, qualities, methodologies, and tools that spatial practitioners need to develop in order to have a positive impact in the face of global challenges affecting cities such as climate change and social inequality. And also, he has two latest book publications entitled Agency, Working with Uncertain Architectures in 2010 and Shift Projection into the Future of Central Belt in 2007. Mm. Before we start, for all participants, please mute, unmute your mic, your mic during the speaker's presentations. Please. Please mute, sorry, your mic during the speaker's presentation. And you can turn it on for raising questions in a Q&A session after the speaker's presentation. And for questions, you can write down your question in the chat box or by raising question directly to Florian after the presentation. And also at the end of the lecture, we will have a photo session all together so during that time, please turn on your camera and we will have a photo session. Yeah, I think that's all from me. Before we start, uh, firstly, uh, on behalf of the architecture department, Petra Christian University, I would like to say thank you very much for your availability, Florian. It is really an honor for us to have you here as our guest lecturer. And yeah, okay, please, the room is yours, Florian. You can start your presentation uh, for about 45 to 60 minutes. Yes. Okay, um, thank you. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yes, How about good. students? Yeah, uh, students, good. I don't know. <laughs> I hope the students are, well, they can't answer, but uh, you can type in maybe a little okay. note at the side mm -hmm. of you or otherwise just shout if you can't hear me. So thank you very much, Ruli, for inviting me. Um, thank you for the uh, Petra Christian University as well for offering me the opportunity to, to talk here today. Um, in my... Yeah, thank you for the, for the short introduction. I mean, Ruli kind of didn't reveal how we actually get to know each other. Um, so... Uh, um, 
I had the honor and pleasure of, uh, of, of supervising um, Ruli in her PhD at um, the Sheffield School of Architecture some, well, now many years ago. Five years ago. And, uh, <laughs> five, five years, years ago. ago. <laughs> uh, it, was a, it was a tremendous piece of work that, uh, that also um, helped me to, to broaden my, my horizon on, on, on urban design and to, to understand how um, urban design and our thinking about urban design has to kind of broaden its perspective um, from a, a mostly, or it is written mostly in a, from, from a Western perspective. Um, a lot of the theories that we're still dealing with uh, are, are coming from an Anglo-Saxon Anglo or Anglo-American realm. Uh, and obviously they are taught across the world, but uh, they're not always applicable. And once we start um, challenging these so-called normative or norms of, of, of urban design and our understanding of architecture and see what they really mean in other contexts, it enriches the whole body of knowledge that we have uh, concerning um, our cities and our writing about it. And, and I think Rulli's work uh, that took uh, Kevin Lynch's um, theories on, on the analysis of, of, of the urban realm has, has really expanded here uh, in a very significant way of, of how we can read and understand and transpose uh, Lynch's, Lynch's work into a different context, specifically in the Indonesian and Surabaya context. So, so that was a fantastic work and uh, some of this still resonates in, in the way how I teach. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for that as well. So um, I will share my screen now and I hope that that works smoothly. In just a second, I have to switch over to PowerPoint. Um, first, I have to go to present now. My entire screen allow. Really, can you just give me an okay that you, you see everything? Not yet, not yet, on progress. Not yet. <laughs> oh, no, no. How about Brown? We, we, Students? I already see it. Already. Oh, okay, yeah. Talita, Good. can you uh, see? Yeah? Yes. Okay, yeah, clear, thanks. Brilliant. It's, it's a really an odd situation to, to know that I'm actually talking to uh, uh, probably some, some 100, 120 students uh, and, and, and lecturers here, but I'm only seeing my screen. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm obviously used to lecture theatres and you, you kind of use the stage almost as your performance stage. You can pace up and down and you see faces and you see reactions. And here I'm talking into the... Um, into the uh, into my computer and just onto my own slides. Um, uh, whether you are actually excited or whether you doze off, I don't really know. Um, anyway, so it's, it's, it's a bit odd, but uh, we, we'll see how it goes. Um, Willie told me a little bit about the, uh, uh, the studio and the work that you've also um, uh, carry out at the moment, this projection into the future about, you know, taking the current current crisis that we're in with uh, Corona and the, the COVID-19 kind of uh, impact that it has on our cities. And doing this guest lecture here today is maybe one form, you know, one hand, you know, we all have to go into that digital realm for, um, for teaching. But it also allows, you know, me to, to give this lecture, which maybe otherwise would not have happened. Um, so, Taking this, this notion of a crisis as a, um, as a start, I, I just want to briefly reflect on this, what that means in relation to architecture has meant in the past. And as really said, also an urban historian. So a lot of my understanding of, or by my view of how we, how we ought, ought to think about the future comes from a closer, more detailed look at our history as well. Because I think there's this, always lessons to learn from that. Um, so I think the first important bit that we really have to understand is that obviously the, the, the crisis 
uh, it's, it's nothing new. It seems to be something that 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 has been around uh, uh, um, from time beginning in the world. I mean, here is a, is a famous painting by by Peter Bruegel uh, from the end of the Middle Ages. It's the it's called the uh, uh, the victory of death. Um, so here we have obviously it's 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 talking about the plague it's talking about illnesses and how this has an effect on society um so a quite gruesome picture but in a way i think it is a reminder that that these uh these existential crises that societies and humans are facing are something that that is not new and is something that will also affect us in the future to a certain degree um when we when we're looking a little bit closer into in, into our more recent history, there's obviously the, the so-called Spanish flu that uh, uh, was uh, killing millions of people in the in the 1990s, 1919. Uh, we have very similar uh, headings here: uh, closes schools and theaters, drastic steps taken to drive the malady from the states, all public gatherings are prohibited. So these are things that we're actually quite familiar with uh, today. Here we have the wearing of the mask in uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, again, a picture that we're facing today. Um, or we look at other events like big uh, um, other diseases like the cholera outbreak in, in Hamburg uh, in 1892, which was already uh, understood of being very closely linked to the densely populated areas of the city. So this here is a map showing the um, the correlation between living density and uh, cholera um, uh, sickness or or infections of through cholera in this area. So so we have the inner city areas and the the denser they're packed the more they were affected by the cholera, which killed thousands of people uh, in Hamburg alone through um, contaminated water. Um, here, pictures of the living conditions of the very densely kind of old towns, uh, uh, still medieval towns in Hamburg, which then after the 1890s were cleared away, people were rehoused uh, into uh, residential areas further afield from the city center and, and obviously um, designed with different standards in relation to um, light, air, ventilation, etc. We have very similar kind of pic these are all pictures here from the, from the cholera. So the separation here of family. And this is a picture today where people in care homes uh, could not be visited. Family had to come like just see their, uh, um, their relatives through the window. Or here, uh, um, the temporary tents that are re uh, erected here for for looking after them. That is a very similar typology to the typologies that we have today with the drive-through testing centres. So architecturally, when it comes to these separations of of people, when it comes to temporary installations, we have uh, like a language or a typology of, of architecture that seems to, to, um, to repeat from, from crisis to crisis. So nothing really new there. And whenever we had these um, uh, uh, health crises, they were also affecting our thinking of, of how, to, how to dwell, how to house people. So there's a very close correlation between that, between sanitary and medical uh, uh, concerns and the concerns about housing. This here is um, a quote from, 19, from 1883 um, from the UK by Lord Salisbury. Thousands of families only a single room to dwell in where they sleep and eat, multiply and die. It is difficult to exaggerate the misery which such conditions of life must cause or the impulse they must give to vice. The depression of body and mind which they create is an almost insuperable obstacle to the action of any elevating or refining agencies. So it's an understanding that these living conditions are detrimental 
to the health uh, of people, but also to the morals, to like their, their well-being, physical and mental well-being, but also then to their agencies of becoming better human beings. So consequently, commissions were set up like the British Corral Commission in 1884-85 that was leading then ultimately to the Housing of the Working Classes Act in 1885 which consequently first for the first time uh, installed something like social housing. So a, a deliberately um, designing or providing of housing for, for poorer classes as well uh, was set up through that. I'm making a jump here and I just want to, to, to quickly run through some examples to show you how architects, architecture has, has dealt with that in, uh, in the past. I mean, we had then uh, in 1942, one of the Siam Congresses, uh, um, Congress of International Modern Architects, um, posed the question, can our city survive? And the question was posed because uh, even at that time, uh, a large part of European cities were considered uh, uh, or contained slum-like areas uh, with huge populations uh, within them very bad uh, sanitary conditions. And in that book, they made, uh, again, correlations between certain illnesses, infant mortality, uh, and how that was very different from the city average to the, to the areas uh, that were considered as slum areas. So areas which were overpopulated, which had no, uh, no running water, which had no toilets, etc. Um, and that then led modern architects uh, uh, to also to consider, you know, how do we actually deal with this? How do we, how do we provide or how do we design a city which is getting rid of this, uh, this, uh, this, these conditions? And even earlier here, Corbusier's famous Plan Voisin from 1925, uh, which uh, uh, is also a reaction uh, um, to his consideration of, of, or how he considered the old city of Paris to be uh, not fit for purpose. And his reaction was to clear it all away and to come up with a completely new kind of like design for the city. But we also have these, uh, these new estates coming up, the, moder in the modernist housing estates, Uh, that, that case, uh, which were then designed outside the city centers or outside the boundaries of the old, uh, the old towns that had gardens as well, which could provide um, uh, families with some kind of self-subsistence, uh, some kind of Schreber garden or uh, gardens in which you could also plant some, uh, some vegetables to sustain yourselves, but basically creating healthy living situations. But what you also see is that we, we, we're starting to, uh, um, to design quite uh, independent uh, and isolated pieces of, of, of urban settlements, of urbanisms, which in a way, another step forward are, are developments like this here in the Emirates in Dubai, where, where we have these uh, separated new here in this case, obviously not working class, but for very wealthy people um, who are separating themselves from uh, uh, the, the, the cities and forming entities in themselves, which are supposedly perfect, um, uh, perfect realms for living. And this brings me back to the to the current crisis and talking about this. I just want to give you four examples. One here is the cruise ship, the airport, the football stadium, and Canary Wharf, the city of London. All four highly specified or specific building typologies, which are in themselves absolutely well you could you could argue perfect architectures because they are they are so purposefully designed um uh the, the cruise ship that you know is almost a a world in itself that can that can 
go over over the oceans with thousands of people, thousands of crew staff. But through that pandemic, it became completely obsolete. Um, you know, they're now mooring in, in harbors or not allowed to, to, to actually travel. Uh, so they became a huge problem. Football stadiums, highly specific um, typologies, empty suddenly, no spectators allowed. So these are architectures which were actually very, very, um, no, sorry, that, that were not able to, to react in any way to that, um, to that pandemic and the crisis that the pandemic um, uh, uh, brought with it. Whereas on the other hand, we have architectures, namely your home, your house, for instance, where suddenly we had to adapt and uh, create offices in our living rooms. We had to kind of do homeschooling in, in our flats. We had to kind of like make do with what we have around. So on a very small scale, we seem to be able, or we had to be, I mean, we, we were and we have to be able to adapt to a crisis. And it seems to be working um, very, very differently. And that made me think as well, you know, how do we actually, into the future if we are if we're seeing that these very perfect architectures are not able to adapt if we're seeing that maybe these these offices here will at some point become actually half empty because you know suddenly we're realizing people can work from home and uh, you know it's not so clever to to pack them all into elevators and you know this all that doesn't make, make sense uh, anymore. So suddenly something like that is, is not uh, a good building anymore, whereas it, it used to be a very high sought after property, you know, it was an icon of office, uh, of office architecture. But suddenly, you know, within the next five, already and in the next five to 20 years, uh, um, this becomes even more kind of, like of a problem. I quite like to um, look at Google now and again, and just, you know, you type in a word, and then crisis, for instance, and it's the first images that come up. So crisis seems to be something which is quite abstract, at least when you go to Google, and it becomes something which is also quite cheerful in the way how um, people seem to be dealing with it. So it's a lot of, uh, Crisis is something that we can actually manage through management courses, through some kind of self-help uh, websites, but it's all about kind of this very corporate approach to um, uh, uh, to a crisis, which is not very specific and which doesn't seem to be relating to real life. And that, that again made me think, you know, why is that? Why do we have on one hand architecture that looks like that? And we also have, you know, images that come up when you, when you, when you uh, uh, type in crisis that come up uh, that, that look like this. So I now want to make that jump into, into this, what I, what I mean when I talk about this everyday adaptations or these small scale adaptations of, of everyday architecture. Um, and why I think that this is important when we think about creating urban design, creating architecture, when we are, um, when we're designing for the future. So, let me start with Lewis Wirt, um, who uh, was the first person to actually define urbanism as a term. Uh, and there's this famous book, Urbanism as a Way of Life, um, or article, which then became a little booklet. So he says, as long as we identify urbanism with the physical ident identity of the city, viewing it merely as a rigidly delimited space, delimited in space, and proceed as if urban attributes abruptly cease to be manifested beyond an arbitrary boundary line, we're not likely to arrive at an adequate conception of urbanism as a mode of life. So for him, coming from sociology, he said, you know, urbanism is not just kind of like the built fabric. It is not the building, it's not just the street, it's not just 
it's a traffic infrastructure, but it is actually the life that happens between it. And it's the life that modifies and ad uh, what it adapts to the built uh, environment, but it also is changing the built environment. And it is also something that can't be quite uh, uh, defined by what we normally put on a, uh, on, a, on a paper when we draw, you know, the boundary lines of our houses, the boundary lines of our streets, because urbanism is permeating them. So when we take this picture here, which is below here, an architect will not have drawn what happened here in front of this building. This is something that we may not have predicted, but, and I think that is uh, why it's so important to look at this, it is something that was possible. Now, whether this is a good thing or not, you know, this is again something that might uh, may be debatable because some people might say, well, they're occupying here the pavement. So anyone who's coming along with a wheelchair will not, or with a push chair, will have to kind of like move onto the street and then back onto again. But on the other hand, we suddenly have here a little piece of greenery. We have a little piece of kind of like a, a little little eco niche that is emerging um, and we have someone who's who created something uh, in front of their house um, which at least to me looks quite lovely and is full of life so something worth thinking about again another quote by Vert a serviceable definition of urbanism should not only denote the essential characteristics which all cities, at least those in our culture, and with that he meant the, the mostly the American culture, have in common, but should lend itself to the discovery of their variations. An industrial city will differ significantly in social respects from a commercial, mining, fishing, resort, university, or capital city. A one industry city will different, present different sets of social characteristics from a multiple industry city, as well as an industrially balanced from an imbalanced city, a suburb from a satellite, a residential suburb from an industrial suburb, a city within a metropolitan region from one lying outside, an old city from a new one, a southern city from a New England one, a Middle Western from a Pacific Coast city, a growing from a stable from a dying city. Now, I think there's something extremely important within this because what, what it means for us as, as architects, as urban designers in projecting cities is that we are what we ought to really understand local context, cultural context, geographical context, and uh, the specificities of particular um, situations in which we're designing in. So, Whereas quite often, and uh, I talked with really uh, briefly about the Neufert and the use of the Neufert as a, as a design tool and design guide for, for students, you know, that is, is something that is, ex that is supposedly universal. And I know, know that students here in Germany or in, uh, where I'm at the moment, or in, in the UK and in Indonesia and in China or wherever, they're all kind of going back to these uh, these standards that have originally been designed by or, or devised by uh, a middle-aged white man in, in Germany um, and are also based on certain criteria which derive from this understanding being a middle-aged uh, German man. Um, but they're somehow applied universally across the globe. And I think there's some problem in that because it does not consider enough, you know, how local situation uh, are, are, are an, an important factor in what cities, what cities are and what our, what the richness of cities are as well. And that's something that we have to think about. Um, we can, and I think the further we drill down into into a smaller scale, into the really kind of like the, the, the very tangible aspects of our city, into the one-to-ones, into the materiality, into what we actually touch and do, and what we hold, where we sit, where what we eat, how we behave in a space. The more we do that, rather than just zooming out and kind of like understanding city 
through its, its grid iron that we are laying out as planners or through the topology of the urban block, uh, the more we can like, we'll learn about um, how cities are actually functioning. So I think that's an extremely important uh, uh, lesson for, for architects, urban designers and planners to, to like look at that very small scale and look at the specificity that is within that scale. I that clear through um, through a work that I've been been influenced in uh, lately a lot, and that I'm, um, or that is maybe going on in in other parts uh, of, of of the world, and uh, not only in Sheffield, but but in Japan a lot, and, and you know in many other places. And maybe you you work work, work similarly, and it's it's using that term of architectural ethno ethnography. And uh, it is something that, that has a longer route, and I come to that in a minute, in Japan, uh, in the work of Vajiro Kon and his modernology research. Um, but in this instance, it's about the architectural ethnography um, that was um, an exhibition um, uh, for, the Berlin, uh, for the Venice Biennale in 2018 uh, by Momo Kajima, who's one part of Adelie Bawao, uh, and together with Lauren Stadler, who's professor in uh, the ETH in Zurich, and in this in this exhibition part, they they collected um, research work, mainly architectural research work, on architectural ethnography, Japanese, but also com um, coming from from other other parts of the world, to present work that was looking in a different way at architecture. Um, which takes into consideration the small sc uh, scale adaptations, the small scale uses um, of of architecture, and by trying to understand how people are are actually using architecture, how they are behaving within it, how they're adapting to it, how they're reappropriating and how they're changing it, um, taking this as further than as cues for designing um, their own architecture in the future. So um, let me give you a few quotes here. So uh, Momojo um, Kajima says, according to the standard dictionary definition, ethnography is the representation of a society and culture of a specific ethnic group based on fieldwork. For our purposes, we might substitute this focus on a specific ethnic group with a broader consideration of people or a community or an as yet undefined social group. We then need to ask what aspects of architecture might be incorporated into the research methods and means of representation of ethnography to create this hybrid form, architectural ethnography. So I, I quite like that also as an approach because it, it says, you know, this is something that we still all try to still you know, you as students, we as teachers, can still um, contribute to that ongoing uh, field or to this growing field um, within the architectural discipline. So what is it about? It is actually kind of like finding ways of representing of what is happening in and with architecture. In Japan, she writes, um, ethnography is a specific practice that arose during a time of profound societal and economic change as the country complement com completed its transition to a modern industrialized state. The architect Vajiro Kon made sketches of the fast disappearing vernacular house form, the Minka, and made the results of his research freely available in the publication Nihon no Minka, Minka of Japan in 1922. Kon likened its surveying of Minka to the collecting of insects, saying that both required intensive and meticulous observation to document the colors, shape, structure, and habitat or environment of the respective subjects. Later, in Modernology from 1927, Kon would apply this method of meticulous observation to the documentation of Tokyo street life, sketching and recording the tools people used, the clothes they wore, and even the way they took a nap. He also documented the aftermath of the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake in Tokyo, surveying the ramshackle shelters that the survivors built using whatever material has to hand. Both the shelters of rubble 
and the Minka were types of architecture on the verge of extinction. Now Momo Kojima then talks about her own work and she writes, by the time I started to study architecture in the late 1980s, Japan's bubble economy was at, at its peak and real estate speculation was rampant. At every opportunity, I walked around the city trying to witness the changes of my, with my own eyes. And again, I read books searching for pages of the root causes of the situation. There was a flurry of publications on Tokyo around this time, partly in response to the rapid urban transformation. A 1987 pocket edition of Rajiro Kon's Kogen Gaku no Yum, or Modernology, um, then from uh, there's a number of other books as well, which were all uh, then inspiring me to imagine different flows of time in the changing cities of Japan. And all of this early Japanese fieldwork from the 1920s to the 1960s was instigated by scholars who feared that the modernization of Japanese society would destroy the pre-modern way of life and where the means of livelihood of the inhabitants was closely allied with the materials and styles of architecture seen in the Minka. So let me, let me just pause here. So, so in a sense this year, they're talking about a different crisis. Obviously it's not a health crisis. It's not in that sense, a human existential crisis, but it's a crisis of a particular culture that is disappearing, a particular architecture that is disappearing. And as they, these, these um, Japanese architects and, and, and others thought at that time, and probably rightly thought so at the time, also of a way of life that was disappearing with this and a livelihood that was disappearing with these um, uh, with these architectures and with these buildings, with these living quarters. So, um, which consequently then would produce personal crises. So, because if, if with these building typologies, if with these architectures, with these houses in which you can, you know, have a living and which you can, which you can actually can like produce and uh, reside and which you can, you know, trade, whatever you do, uh, if the they disappear, then, then also your livelihood disappears, your way of making a living disappears, which causes obviously uh, then personal existential crises. So like, back to the quote, like the emerging, uh, emergence of the ethnographic studies during the period of profound social uh, transformation, the proliferation of this kind of research from the 80s and similar to that of Made in Tokyo, that famous book that Atli Bawao uh, with Momo Kajima uh, did, is perhaps in some way a reaction to the rapid urbanization and the changes wrought by globalization, advances in technology, natural disasters, and war. Here we have this notion of the crisis again. So wandering through the streets of Shibuya in 1991, the year of Japan's acid bubble burst, I came across an intriguing apparition, a spaghetti snack bar crowned by a baseball batting cage. I never got the chance to survey the building. It was demolished shortly after I discovered it. But this was the virtual prototype for the Made in Tokyo project. It set me to thinking about the building types that are specific to Tokyo, buildings not defined as single entity, but as environmental elements or hybrid assemblage that bring together otherwise unrelated functions or structures. Made in Tokyo, that book that they did, and I presume many of you know it, describes an architecture that is itself defined and shaped by accidents of the site and the, prepar and the participation of the people who inhabit it. So Made in Tokyo looks at architecture that is not designed by architect, but is made by people, you know, builders and then altered to it. And it is an architect that works architecture which works with accidents, but it's also an, an architecture that is able to change an architecture that doesn't, you know, care about certain aesthetics which will be destroyed through a change, and is therefore an architecture which is really adaptable uh, and can react to certain crises. Yes, at some points it also disappears, but it's also one which is kind of. Uh, there as an, as, a, as an important element in the continuity uh, of, of the city. And that's why they were looking at it. Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction here. So 
just briefly, because um, I'm, I'm realizing that I'm talking a little bit too, um, too, too long. So Vajira Khan was, was there. And he, I just want to, if you're not familiar with the work, you should make yourself familiar. Because I think it's, it's wonderful how he started to, um, to make these observations. So modernology is what we fellow students of contemporary customs and manners have named our approach and methodology. And the totality of the work that we have undertaken that's what Shiro Kon now uh, writing in 1927. We call it modernology because we deliberately wish it to contrast this field of research with archaeology. While the study of the ruins and remains of ancient times has found a clear scientific method and involved into the discipline of archaeology, the study of the things of today remains unscientific. It is in response to the situation that we sought to establish here the methodology it deserves. So again, if you can see here already from that, that drawing in the background, we have a one-handed architectural drawing, but we also can like, he's also concerned with the furniture that goes with it. But he's not only concerned with the furniture, but he's also concerned with all the objects that are in that furniture or the flower pots that are on the wardrobes that are uh, decorating this. So in a sense, it's kind of documenting the whole entity of life that goes on within it, which brings us all or we to put that, that vert um, made about urbanism. So he was all looking at customs and the way how people were dressing. This, this here were the shelters that Moyo uh, Kajima was talking about it. Like archeologies, span ours a research method whose object of study is what unfolds today before our very eyes. Therefore, what we intend to investigate is humanity's present state. Much like historical science relation to archeology, span Sociology will serve as a modernology's counterpart. In other words, modernology will operate as an auxiliary science to sociology. So I think, again, very interesting to, to, to understand that, you know, we as architects also have to find a way of how we are researching like this everyday life. And we're bringing something to it which sociology alone with ethnography alone can't because we have like skills to look differently at architecture, we have the skills to draw it. We have the skills to kind of like also understand things spatially. I mean, that's that's the uh, the key element that we as architects and architecture students also can bring to it. So here again, you know, it's about also how we are using certain spaces, how we're moving about from one place, how a woman dresses, but then you know what is her her journey in uh, in a street. What is she doing this? It's finding notations um, which are important here. So we find in these forms of everyday life, sorry, um, in historic architecture, here a picture of Venice, you know, where we see how, how things are adapting, how people are using the roof terraces, how they are like expanding their shops into the street, how they are, how they're mooring with their boats, etc. So it's about, it's not just about the buildings, but it's how these buildings are used, how they allow for a certain social life, which we should be interested in. And if we translate this, then, you know, we find this in a very small scales, through things like this here. You now people who are uh, trying to make a, a old pensioners, uh, that, that's some, some years ago now in, uh, in Latvia, um, you know, tr just trying simple goods to, to make uh, some, some, extra, uh, some extra money. But what they're needing is very, very reduced. You know, they need something to sit down. They need a box to like put down a, a a little table on which table then then put down the, uh, the the goods that they're using. So so very very small little architectural elements, but it's a, important to cl look closely at these um, uh, at the dimensions which are needed, at the spaces which are needed. Because when we do that, then we also can design uh, on an urban design level, an architectural level. Um, you know, something that would allow for that activity to happen. Because as architects, we have the ability to either design some such possibilities in, or we have the, the possibility to design them out. And I think if we are actively designing them out, we are preventing 
you know, life to kind of like then adapt and people to kind of like take agency um, within these spaces and trying to transform them in a way which is, you know, uh, important to their livelihood. Same here. So it's about this life that we should be interested in. Now I want to um, uh, now briefly um, show how I'm doing that with students and I'm showing you on one hand some work, a workshop that I've done with uh, master students in Nanjing. It's about the reappropriation of, of buildings and the adaptation of architectures uh, and the public realm. And again, you know, it's about asking students to look very carefully at the conditions of existing architecture about the materiality of architecture because i think the materiality the textures is extremely important it's important you know can i actually fix something to a railing can i drill a hole into it can i put a nail in it can i bind a little um uh with a string can i fix something with a string to these elements is the niche under that balcony big enough to store something so all these elements are crucial to understand, and we understand them by looking carefully, by drawing them. So here, a house, we were drawing what is happening in front of this house. It's about finding makeshift, you know, discarded material, which then become the shelter, uh, which allows me to actually sit, uh, uh, sit even if it rains outside. But I'm also offering chairs to other people who might visit me. It gives, um, I'm also kind of using this here as a little bicycle pump. So in a sense, I'm offering a service to people who have to kind of like, uh, repair their bike. So I'm getting a couple of yuan for, for this. Um, I'm, I'm hanging a little curtain um, from that support of the air conditioner, um, which then provides a rent shelter I'm also using this here to collect some rainwater, which then goes into the flowers. So by really understanding how these things relate to another and how they, um, what kind of materiality they have, we understand what is needed when we design um, architecture, when we predict for the future, how then in an even further future, people are able to uh, make something with that. So here we have that as a spatial situation or the different, uh, the different usage of, of underpasses, um, either as storage or seating areas or as uh, outdoor um, living rooms. We have to investigate how that happens during, during the day. We have here um, then an investigation, how that happens within a series, how that happens not only in one corner, but if we want to draw some conclusions from that, we may not only be looking at one situation, but we're taking similar situations and seeing how they're existing throughout the city. Here we have um, a situation where something becomes temporarily an outdoor restaurant. So at some point you see that in the drawings below, um, nothing is really there, everything is stored away. And then a temporary um, outdoor kitchen is actually open, tables are erected. But it, again, it is extremely important what we have. We have, in terms of architecture elements, we have a wall that gives protection. We have a wall on which we can fix a canopy, which is then, uh, or, or tarpaulin, which is then pulled over, uh, over that space, which provides us with some kind of um, uh, shading. We have um, enough kind of storage facility to, um, to put the tables away because it only kind of like happens in the afternoon. We have protection from the loud street, etc. So looking closely at these relations is important to understand that. Here we have then detailed drawings. Another example um, is this bike repair shop here. Um, which many might not consider architecture, but I think it's, it's operating on a very, very spatial, um, uh, spatial level. And I'm, um, again, we're first looking at, um, so this here is, is the setting. It's, it's kind of like in between the street, one way street in that direction, one way street in the other. And this car mechanic or 
someone who became a car mechanic, is occupying a space which was otherwise used for car parking. But he parks his, his, his own van there, which becomes uh, his, his garage storage. And in front of that, he's then uh, building up his outdoor garage. And it is, this, it is something that has gradually evolved. First, he had his shop or his, his stand here on the other side, then they opened. Clyde took the opportunity to Clyde establish himself in the shadow of this street planter here. So that planter of trees, that's maybe better seeing here, yeah, that planter here was extremely important for him to giving shelter uh, Giving, like also giving the spatial dimensions to, um, to establish uh, his little stall. But then it's important to look closer. Why is he there? You know, why is he doing that uh, like that? It's, he's actually um, a trained uh, engineer who was working in a factory, but the job, uh, the factory closed. He lost his shop. He realized, what are my... my um, um, my skills. I'm actually good in repairing things. I understand tools. Uh, I can work with metal. So this is something which I can then collect, um, use further. So there's a social and economic story which is related to that. And quite often we as architects and urban designers are not funding enough uh, in, in really kind of like looking also into the skills of people, of how they could then use certain spaces because they have certain skill sets that they bring with us. So it's important to look at that. But likewise, it is important to understand that um, his, the position of that bike um, repair shop is dependent also on the facilities and the infrastructures that he has around it. Because obviously there's no toilet there, there's no running water there, um, and there's, there's, a, there's, there's nothing to eat there. But it is well positioned with, because uh, all around it, he has kind of like established, you know, this is where I can eat, this is where I can use a toilet in a restaurant, this is where I can get my water, this is where I have my, my other, uh, my, my customers who are working around it. So there's a social and economic infrastructure um, uh, that comes with it as well, which is around that. Then his own family is important because, you know, why is he there? Because the father of the mechanic is there, but the student is there, the university is here, the mother there is a cook in the university. So again, this, this is a social economic and like infrastructure that all kind of like um, uh, uh, goes around that space of that car, uh, of that, um, uh, car mechanic's place, which relates then also to his income, et cetera, et cetera. So, it has implications of how that plays out over the, uh, over the whole day. I don't want to go into too more details with this. But the thing is that from that, we can then start to uh, deduct certain, uh, certain principles, because this is now where, where, we, where we as architects have to make the, uh, the transitions. Um, so we are, what the students did here was actually looking at what are the preconditions, both on a social level, on a, uh, on a family level, on an economic level, on a skills level, on a spatial level. Uh, you know, how, what, what's the distances that he needs to a restaurant, to a toilet? What's the spatial? What's this? What's the uh, what's the road uh, conditions that he needs to? And once you're once you're breaking this down, you then realize well, actually, these modern houses that are propping up now all over um, the Chinese cities, and I'm, I'm sure in Surabaya as well. Uh, um, they, and the urban realm that is between these houses does at the moment not allow for these things to happen. So one, when we have a spatial layout like this, it is not kind of compatible with uh, the activity or for someone who's losing this job to do the same thing as they were, were, were able to do in the old town, in the, in the, in the denser packed old town. So the question that these students that were then asking, so what do we have to do to actually modify um, these, these streets, these new, um, uh, these new housing areas in terms of, you know, uh, shop distances, road profiles, pavements, 
infrastructure, etc., which would in the end then allow for something like that to happen. And I think this is something that we as architects can then also take forward and where we can learn from that. Um, Ruli, do you give me another 10 minutes or? Um, How about five minutes? Five so, minutes is good. Let's yeah, do five okay. minutes. Okay. So just as an example, um, uh, then let me, uh, so we, we also doing this in a master studio so here becomes you know it's not a um it's not a um uh, uh a workshop which was only 10 days so everything becomes a little bit more sophisticated but similar principle you know a student investigates an existing uh housing area we're looking at how people are actually using this so these are these are all infrastructure these are all invest um uh, installments of furniture, of changes to the architecture, of uses of kind of like reuse of reappropriating of ground floor flats, uh, which have been transformed into shops and looking exactly, you know, what is happening here? How has that happened? What is needed? You know, how, how are spaces created? You know, what you see here, you, we're not shops in the first place, but we're actually flats on the ground floor or slightly raised ground floor. And have been gradually transformed into into shops because people um, wanted to have some kind of commercial income as well, or needed to to find to find ways to to do that. And then you are investigating these um, their their spatial settings, you know, through distances. How is their relation to the sidewalk? So by learning from examples like that, we can then again deduct principles of how something like that could be translated into design strategies where we as designers in this case can like intervene in existing housing uh, uh, complexes but can I provide similar things as an offer which then would have to be like taken up by 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 the residents um, in order to improve this housing, but rather than like designing something completely to its uh, to its end, it's rather about looking very carefully about certain principles, which are um, uh, which derive from the life within these buildings, and the way how architectures, small architectures, have been adapted by people, and that is something that we can then translate into architecture. And to conclude with, just to show you that this is also done in architecture, I just want to show you, um, so that's for the last three minutes, the housing complex uh, or the, the, the settlement Aranya in Andorra by, by Krishna Doshi, which was started in 1982. And Doshi's early housing experiments, and he did a lot of low-cost housing, uh, but in the end, probably more for, for um, people who were employed by, by certain companies and it was certain company housing, um, things like this, which now also have been completely adapted. So this is, uh, this is uh, just after completion and it's been changed by people. So if you, if you look at the Life Insurance Corporation housing in Amdabad, it, it looks lovely now, um, similar with this here. And this here is indoors, so a huge housing estate um where for 50,000 people um but what what Doshi and the Shipla uh, Vasto Shipla Foundation did was actually study squatter settlements and try to understand how they work not romanticizing them in any way but understanding their spatial and structural uh qualities and also seeing how people are um adapting uh, in uh, well, adapting their life within those. So, so what they first did was kind of like understanding, you know, what are the, how are spaces created? Because what you, um, what happens when you're starring these buildings is that you're constantly creating little niches of outer spaces, which can be then appropriated, which can be used, which gives some kind of shelter as well which a normal grid iron would not do. So there's a certain principle within this, which can then be translated into the architecture. Squatter settlements repeat some of the spatial layouts of villages, but without the beauty and lyricism of rural forms, did I understand that. In the Indora project, a hierarchy of street was suggested, which gradually diminishes in size and so on. Anyway, so they're taking uh, clues from that. And here you can then see what happens. But what I want to hint at is this 
because what what uh, what they did first was understand so what is the thing that people can actually not do themselves and that is usually the water infrastructure so by uh, by first like parceling off the land and then by identifying the the cores of the, the water infrastructure and building this and then allowing people to gradually according to their hopefully growing economic and like uh, 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 or to, to, to economic growth, you know, they're becoming having more and more money. Um, they can also extend their house first, like it's a very temporary kind of thing and that could then be extended into several stages. So here you see that field in any site and service scheme and that's what it is. The service cores from the nuclei are um, formed from the nuclear which the houses grow and the communities eventually develop. Water supply, sanitation constitute the largest cost components to such developments and thus becomes the prime targets for efficient design. So what do we plan for the future and what is then happening after that future as well? So I think now again, you know, uh, dealing with this on one hand with an existential crisis, which is poverty, people don't have a lot of money, yeah? but you need to like, provide them with something. And what are you providing them with? Are you providing them with that, which is the most costly, which they can't do themselves. But then from then on, you can also can, like, see how they are um, uh, developing this by themselves. And it is an architecture which is not predicting how something, as you can see in this picture at the at the bottom there how the final product really will have to look like you know this is something that that emerges you know though he uh, they they first designed some of the houses as you can see here and he will still have a very architectural like language with it you know which was to a certain degree defined by uh, by doshi in his office but this is something which is then only a suggestions it's a model for future dwellers and house types and suggested materials, and steps for implementation, but it's also something which is open to spontaneity, which is something which is open to change. So it doesn't have to look like that, but it becomes something which is gradually like, uh, you know, adapted and changed by people. So that's me finished now. Um, and what I wanted to, to like, uh, uh, exemplify is that we we can design quite large scale urban settlements as well, which are able to adapt, which are able to grow, which are able to change, which something like that. Because if we are, if we still understand architecture like a cruise ship, like this perfect ocean liner, there's no capacity in this ship to change. There's no capacity to react to a crisis. There's no capacity for it to become, uh, uh, to extend, to grow, to shrink. So I think all that we as architects should be concerned about, we as urban designers should be concerned about, is about devising structures, devising plans, which have this ability to be pre-altered, where we shouldn't be precious about, you know, certain aesthetics, which are then, you know, maybe destroyed by people who are putting their washing railing in, where we are um, afraid of individual changes that happen to, to that, because this is where, where life actually comes into it. This is where people have the ability to, to react to very small scale individual crises, or to formulate it positively, where people have the ability to actually exert their agency, to exert their agency to become kind of participants within the creation of our cities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian. I think it's a very interesting presentation from you and the students. Already has several questions in the text box. Can you see the, the chat box, Florian? I can see the chat box. Okay. Yes, let me just. Ah, oh, good. There's a question from so Talita. So, where do we start? Yeah. From Talita. I think it's better, Talita, raise uh, your voice, <laughs> turn on your mic, probably. You can. Sorry, are you talking to me now? or? No, Talita, the, the students. Talita. Uh -uh. Yeah, Talita. Hi, Talita. Do you want to, to ask that question yourself? or? 
Uh, yeah, sure. Hi, Mr. Kosek. Uh, so my question to you is that earlier you mentioned that the after the Spanish flu, we basically re relocate everyone from the slums into social housings so they can get better life quality, right? But then, as we can see now, there's still a lot of slum areas, especially in Indonesia. It's, it's like we forget about the past and we keep doing the same mistakes again and again. So do you personally think that after this pandemic, we will finally change the way we perceive them and change the way we design spaces for them for good this time? So we don't do the same mistakes again. Okay. Um, a little correction, sorry. That was me jumping historically back and forward uh, as well with the, um, uh, uh, with, with my slides. The, the slum clearances um, is something that happened uh, already earlier at the well end of the 19th century, and I was here referring more to the, the cases in in uh, uh, in the UK, and whether it was London or whether or the cases in Germany with Hamburg. Um, with the Spanish flu, there was less of a of of, of slum clearances that happened. They were they were also in the 1990, uh, 1920s or nineteen tens, nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties. We still had slum clearances in 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 Western cities or European and American cities, um, but but they were not so related to the um, uh, uh, to the Spanish flu pandemic. But I think your question is a different one. We we. Um, or to go to that core, so we had examples of slum clearances, people were housed in, in social housing, uh, uh, but nowadays we still have, uh, we still have um, uh, slums in our cities. Now, the conditions why slums emerge obviously differ from, from country to country, from cities to cities, and slums are also uh, uh, different. I mean, and we can also have slums in uh, more or less very contemporary high-rise uh, uh, buildings in Hong Kong or so, you know, where people are, are living in cage housing and uh, in un unsufferable kind of dense, uh, uh, dense conditions. Uh, you can have that uh, as more temporary shelters in, in India or maybe also in Indonesia um, on, on, on uh, more one or two scale. Uh, two-story high, high housing. The question is not so much can we design as architects um, or do away with slum, uh, can we as architects do away with slums, but it's rather a question towards the society, whether, we, whether the society would be prepared to um, find more equitable and more uh, evenly shared uh, uh, ways of, of, of yeah of, sh of sharing our resources of sharing our wealth because um, you know i think we we, we we still all live in, in societies that are um that are very uneven and uh um in 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 economic terms and social terms and as long that that exists we will always have uh situations where people are are then living in conditions which uh, uh, we, we will con consider as slums because we, we, our society or our economic system is to a certain degree based on the exploitation not only of, human, of, of, of natural resources but also on the exploitation of human resources. Uh, and uh, as long as we get away with that, um, I think you will always have... Um, areas where poorer people are, have to move in where they can, like have to uh where they can't afford to have um uh decent decent housing unless we're we are creating as i said you know the economic conditions which uh would allow them to to afford um uh this this housing that we consider or that we all I guess could her as uh, as adequate. But probably the point is to uh, more do research on their local context, right? Especially for people living in slums area, if the architects want to rebuild their area. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I do, see, see what I don't think what I don't think works really well is to clear slums. Yeah. Mm. Or put it this way, what historically hasn't worked that well, and that's why it's interesting to look at, at historical examples, is to clear slums and then to rehouse people. And that is that happened in, in, in Britain in the 1940s and 50s, and it happens in China at the moment. Uh, and then you're rehousing uh, them somewhere in the outskirts yeah, of the city, far removed from their, uh, from their places of work as well, far removed from, uh, you know, any kind of social and cultural infrastructures. Um, you, you're breaking up um, formerly existing like um, social and cultural bonds, uh, et cetera. And you, you're placing them in architecture, which is not adaptable, architecture that doesn't, you know, um, allow them to then utilize this housing also to um, uh, create an economic basis. And I think that that's problematic. Yeah. So if, if you look at a lot of rehousing projects for slums over the, over the, over the centuries, what they all, oh, and that's, that's still part of our very modernist planning ideology, which tries to separate out functions. Yeah. Um, is that, that the big, yes, the housing is on the surface, obviously of better quality, they might have more space, they will have, you know, toilets and bathrooms and kitchens, etc. Uh, um, they might have much better sanitary conditions. But if you are in a, now in a flat on a 12th floor, on a 15th floor, whatever, yeah, you cannot use your flat also uh, in any way that it, it you know, it, you can't put a bicycle pump in front of your, uh, in front of your front door on the 12th floor to like make a little bit of extra money by pumping people's bikes up. Yeah. You can't uh, put, uh, <laughs> you can't put that extra layer of, 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 um, of social meeting space in front of these, these flats. Yeah. So I think, um, when we rather understand or look look more carefully at the qualities and that I believe there are and, and the work that that really also did uh, with some of the kampongs in in, uh, uh, in Surabaya you know understanding what what spatial and social qualities like exist in these kampongs as well yeah then I think it is more it is more important to see okay how can we get how can we transform some of the the, the problematic aspects say the, the 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 water drainage or the you know the the, the sewage that goes into a, a into a water canal which shouldn't shouldn't be happening yeah or you know maybe some poor building material and then gradually in a more you know going back to what was developed in berlin the careful urban renewal processes you know maybe there's there's ways of also giving them people who live there the agency to transform the areas into something better uh, rather than say, okay, let's 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 take it all down, rehouse you, because that my experience is um, I have yet to see an example where that really works extremely well. Normally, these rehousing projects uh, have not really created um, uh, in the long run, mm -hmm. yeah, very good housing conditions. Sorry, that was a long answer to your question, Talita. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Talita, for your question. It's very interesting because I also want to ask later, probably Florian, about that uh, we facing about the standards of the uh, social housing, a very small house. We call it rusun. Flat flat is rusun. Rumah susun is for uh, relocation for poor people, but it's very small. It's very inappropriate, I think, but. But yeah, we, we, we can discuss it later. We, we still have more questions from students. I think from Christina, can you ask directly, Christina? Where mm -hmm. are you? Yeah. Well, hello, sir. Can you hear my voice? Yes, clearly. Yes, hello, Christina. Okay, yeah. sir. Uh, earlier, you showed pictures about the vertical building. And lately, it seems like this vertical building has grown rapidly around the world because the limited of the land use, but it seems like contracting when the pandemic situation come like this. 
where actually we need fresh air and physical distancing. But for those who live inside vertical building, they use the same elevator and stuff. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about this phenomenon? Thank you. Um, yeah, obviously the, the, the vertical building uh, has been extremely prolific. Um, um in in the in the last century um i think it's, it's not just the limit of land availability but i think it goes hand in hand with uh, um, buildings and architecture becoming or or being commodities and it is it is a way of generating uh more revenue out of one piece of land so it's not per default a housing typology which um, needs to be developed uh, necessarily, but there's one the way how, how buildings and housing is produced um, for, for decades now is one which um, allows investors, house builders, um, owners of that land to get more revenue out of it. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, if we would consider other uh, other ways of thinking about about land and land ownership and the way how um, cities are generally you know developing throughout um, a country and where we build and how we build um, then i think this this notion of of high-rise um, residential buildings would not have happened as much or in that way as it as it did um, in the past and would also not have to happen in the future and and you're right i mean it now causes a lot of um uh, problems with the pandemic i don't think it's only the the um uh um the uh the lifts which obviously you know the circulation how do i get in and out of my my building i mean we we have now also the same problem in uh in sheffield at the university you know really remembers you know it's in the arts tower um uh, so the architecture school is is in a tower from floor 13 up until floor 19 mm -hmm. of that building and has two lifts and also paternoster but um they 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 still haven't quite figured out and school uh, is opening up partly at least uh, i think next week how they get students up and down the tower yeah with uh without huge delays um um, so it's 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 not only for for re residential things; it's also for educational buildings, it's for office buildings. We have similar kind of like issues of how many how you how you solve circulation, but it's also I must say I'm, um, uh, we're in an extremely lucky situation during this whole lockdown and pandemic. We're living on the ground floor in a well smaller apartment building. It's only four stories, but we have a little garden in front of it and. You know, so so this, and yes, and the flat is relatively large. Um, so being here, yeah, also doing the homeschooling, having kids around, having the possibility to also be outside in the garden, was a real luxury. This is was what many people, and maybe also many of you, could did not have or couldn't have. You know, it's it's being confined in a in a very small uh, small room, small or small flat. Uh, on floor 12 uh, with no, no direct uh, uh, relation to the outdoor realm, with no easy facilities to go outside. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge, huge problems that, that arise from, from this typology. Um, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that, um, but I think it's, it's great that now you as as students are thinking about these and you know it makes you you know question certain typologies that we have taken for granted too long and to think you know how can we you know what happens if we are dealing with a similar density but maybe only five stories high which is still something that you could do with stairs but then you also have to like see you know how are people who are elderly and less 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 capable of walking maybe using ground floors so you have to kind of like also think about different ways of distributing people throughout um throughout a, um, a multi-story complex so 
So again, yeah, I think it's it's it could be very interesting to do that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you, Florian. I hope that answers a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Christina. I think I know the background why Christina asking that question because for the this studio project is about designing vertical buildings, maximum of twelve story buildings. So probably Christina think that this is not a good answer to to predict the architecture in 2030 probably <laughs> probably we also now have a uh, two more or three more questions from yeah. michelle michelle can you raise your voice michelle you here? Uh, hello yeah uh, hello, okay michelle. can you hear my voice i can yes okay uh hello sir i want to ask you about your opinion on this statement Relocating people from the slum areas are not the solution because you will only be relocating the slum from landed houses to the vertical houses. Do you agree with that? Uh, that's my question. Thank you. Okay, I, I could give you a very short answer. Yes. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, no, I agree with that. It's not, it's not an answer. No. I think it's an answer from from on, on many many levels. You know, and I, I hinted at some of them already with the previous um, questions that um, uh, that were here. Uh, I think it, the relocation. But what what is it doing? It's also considered also on a, on a different level. At the moment, you have these slums are predominantly in or or are part within a more inner city areas as well yeah uh, or relatively close to that and uh, the relocations happen again broadly speaking to areas where there are fields so um at the peripheries of these growing cities now what that and then once the slums is cleared you're building other types of housing normally not the replacement housing of the for, for for the poor people, but you you're building on that um, new commercial complexes or housing for the middle and upper classes. So so what you also do gradually with this process is you are, you are segregating uh, more and more of the city, yeah, by 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 driving driving certain groups out of uh, out of the city. You kind of no you you. <laughs> You're, you're gentrifying, you're cleansing the city out of such, such, certain groups, which I think um, is, again, you know, um, a, a very questionable um, approach because it, it, it denies the right to the city and being active parts of the city, um, act, active citizens, to um, then a poor or the poorer um, uh, the poorer population. Yeah, so I think that's because because when you're further afield, you know, you, it's 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 difficult to take part in the daily life of the city, whether it's political activities, whether it's cultural activities, whether it's social activities. Yeah, um, and I think that's um, personally, I think that's not right. So uh, it's it's not just the issue of you know going from a landed house, as you said, to a vertical house, but it's 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 wider than that. It's more of a societal um, level as well, which, which I find it problematic. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Florian. Thank you, Michelle, for your questions. And we still have two more questions, three more questions probably, from Timothy. Please raise your voice, Timothy. Are you here? Can you all hear my voice? Yeah, I'm here. Yes. yes. All right. So, there seems to be an ongoing pattern between the designer and the user where the designer designs a house, the users add a canopy, and then designers add a better canopy, and then the user dislikes the canopy and change it. So there's this subsequent process of re-modifications again and again by both users and designers. Is this a healthy or desirable relation between the designer and users? Or it just shows that as designers, we're really incapable of predicting uh, perfectly what future holds, or should be we should we be more pragmatic to design? 
Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I don't. I, I don't know whether you really have to dis, the, the, the situation that you know a designer designs a house and then you know someone puts up a temporary canopy and then the designer comes along saying, "Oh, I'm, I'm designing you a more, more, more beautifully and appropriate canopy," and you know takes the 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 the, the user designed or user built canopy away again because realistically, you know that that's that's quite often financially not not possible you know people are, um, are doing these makeshift adaptations because they are um, uh, you know they, they have no means to deploy a, a designer or an architect to, to say okay come on design me that beautiful canopy and uh, and then then build it I mean some people have yeah and that, that's great and uh, um, but but most people don't. So, but on the other hand, obviously, what we what we could already, you know, as designer, think about is, you know, do I, um, do I design in something like a lintel or a little plank or something where, in future, you potentially could fix something to it. Yeah. Do I already provide an architecture where it's easy to screw something in, fix something in? Yeah. That's what I'm. I'm I was. Uh, what I was hinting at. I don't think you can predict. Um, and I think you're right. As as architects, we can only predict the future to a certain degree. Yeah. We just have to look back, and again, and that's why it's so 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 fruitful to look back into the into the past as well, uh, to think, you know, to 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 what extent were people right in predicting the future, but also to see, you know, what what has changed in the last twenty thirty years uh, alone. Yeah, I mean, we without even even ten years ago. That what we are doing at the moment would not have been possible. That video conferencing, me giving this talk here, yeah, you all sitting in different or sitting at home uh, or wherever you are at the moment, yeah. So, so this 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 spatial situation that we have at the moment, I don't think we could have probably predicted. I mean, certainly people in the 1960s did not predict that. Yeah, I, I doubt that in 2000 everyone would had already thought about it in this way, but, but maybe, maybe not, I don't know. So there's certain things that we are, that we are just not, um, not comprehending uh, or, or too difficult to comprehend. And still, I think there are, there are architects who are, who, who are capable of designing the most exquisite and beautiful buildings. I mean, don't get, don't get me wrong. You know, I, I understand that, you know, there is a, there's, there's a certain um, value in, in this as well, that, that some people can, um, designing, you know, a beautiful pavilion and a beautiful church or a, um, uh, even a nice cafe. And that's, that's, you know, nicely designed, but, the majority of, of, of built artifacts which are around existing in a, uh, are in existence around the world are a not designed by architects yeah uh, and, and, and certainly not and even if they are designed by architects certainly not like this this quiz, exquisite kind of uh, p little pieces of, uh, of, of boutique architecture but quite you know box standard ones yeah you know, standard housing, standard office buildings, etc. So, so I'm I'm to a certain degree interested in these 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 really standard everyday um, um, uh, typologies because I think w when we are when we are able as designers to design them to a certain degree less specific and more open, less less closed in a sense yeah and i think close then we don't have to predict the future we just accept that our architecture our buildings will to a certain degree be be altered to put it this way 
there are, there's, when you talk about flexible housing, for instance, you know, you could, there, there's a lot of um, people who, particularly in the 1960s, thought about system building. You know, you're, you're developing everything down to the, to the panels that could be shifted around. And, you know, there's all these configurations that you, that you can slide that wall here and this or, you know. But what you needed for that was kind of to, to have a, almost, you have a storage for all these panels to then go into places and all the fixings that, that were, uh, that were then already pre-designed, uh, all the services that were already pre-designed, and that any eventuality you would then maybe uh, implement at a later stage. The problem with this is that, you know, you can only um, plan for so many possibilities in the future, and many of the elements themselves might become obsolete. You also need to have a huge kind of... Um, repository of material somewhere or storage of material somewhere for, for this, yeah? So what might be easier is to have spaces which are actually large and undefined enough, yeah? Where it's then possible for people to build in a little timber stud wall, yeah? Into it to partition something off. And you don't really care how that stud wall is created, yeah? or whether it's made out of bricks, yeah? If you're, if you're maybe being, being able to, to think about the load bearing, you know, so um, elements of your floor. So it's about thinking, thinking about that. It's not thinking of the perfect system which can, you know, be adapted in the future to any kind of now imaginable eventuality. It's about designing a building, designing a city, designing or an urban block, designing a city, which is undefined enough, which is open enough for things to happen. But like an empty theater stage, yeah, where people are bringing in their props, and you know, you you just place a stool, you place a, you know, a backdrop, you let a curtain go, yeah, and suddenly it's transformed into something. But you. As the stage, as the theater designer, you're not designing every stage design that will happen on that stage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Florian, for your tips. Timothy, thank you for your question. I think we are running out of time, but we still have two more questions. The last question, I think, from Bu Susetio. Please, Bu. Uh, good afternoon, Florian. Thank you for your good afternoon. Lecture. Yeah, it's really uh, an interesting lecture because uh, we in Indonesia mostly have been oriented on to the Western uh, theories. So sometimes we get confused between what happened in Europe or US that are uh, different with our situation in Indonesia. But from your case, we can see that uh, there is a similarity between Indonesia and uh, India, it says, uh, in Japan for a long time ago. So my question actually is, mm -hmm. I would like to uh, ask your opinion. In Indonesia, it is uh, basically dualistic. So one hand is consists of the formal host or urban housing. That's, it was uh, informal what we call a uh, rural village that transformed into urban uh, settlement. And on the other hand, it's a low density settlement that continue to develop by the landowner. Because our, our government is, uh, you know, as a developed country, is, don't have money but to build a lot of social housing. So what your opinion on labeling the kampung as slum because we know that label informal and formal housing is started when at the beginning when the modern uh, European theorists come to Indonesia say that this is formal and that one kampung is not uh, formal they informal and then sometimes the informal label as uh, slum so what is your opinion that when it's not when a the urban designer because sometimes we argue a lot with urban designer that 
categorize the kampung as urban slum and they have to be demolished to make a Surabaya a great city, something like that. So despite of improve the condition of the kampung, empower the community to improve their social and economic uh, uh, capacity, they choose to demolish the kampung. Um, yeah, I think there's there's already um, well a, uh, a a clue in your um, in your question. Um, you say you know what is your opinion on labeling the kampong as a slum? I think that there, there's there's something in that because slums uh, using the term slum is normally coming from people uh, in positions of power people um, in positions of a, of a different economic uh, um, uh, environment. Um, and it's, it's something, you know, where you, where you look at a particular area and you declare, you declare it as a slum. I, I, I doubt that many people living in these so-called slums call their own situation also a slum. But it would be interesting. I don't know whether how how Indonesians or residents of the campus talk about them, uh, whether they use this term. But what what the declaration or what the labeling of slum quite often does and has done in the past is, it's been used by planners by politicians to identify uh, an area as being uh, beyond. Uh, um, uh, beyond regeneration, beyond or beyond um, keeping, yeah? And therefore it has to be like uh, taken away, you know? So as soon as you say slum, you know, it is something that is bad, that the connotations that you have uh, that go along with that, that word um, almost require you to get rid of the slum, yeah? Because if, if you're in your right mind, you can't say, hey, I want to keep a slum, yeah? Because um, with that, a slum has you know bad sanitation, is overcrowded, has uh, has higher mortality, has higher um, uh, quite often higher illiteracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah, but because people are poor in those yeah areas and uh, don't have the same facilities as other people have. Maybe. Um, so the labeling itself can become problematic because it is used as uh, as a strategic measurement to 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 actually get rid of areas. So in that sense, the, the notion of informal and formal is maybe a more interesting one as well, um, because it allows, at least in the discussion around them, to to discover um, qualities within informality. Yeah. Um, the problem is when, when informality is equated with illegality, which in some cases this is, I don't think in the, in the kampongs, yeah. Um, but um, when people see formal as good, informal as bad. Um, I guess, you know, we, we just have to come to an understanding that these are just two different ways of creating cities. And that's why I find the Edora example so so interesting because on one hand you can say well of course it's a very formal planning as well yeah because you know they, they, there's a master plan for the whole area um they're, they're planning the the, the, the water and uh, sanitation infrastructure um for it as well you know with these with these service cores they they're planning the, the shopping centers the cultural centers um but then on one hand it also spatially takes its clues from informality or from informal settlements, but it also accepts informality in a sense of the construction itself. Yeah, so um, it 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 provides a formal planned structure basis, but then the interpretation of that allows for informality by people are actually kind of building their own houses. There, there, there's no, there's no given style. There's no given, you know, there's certain elements that they have to adhere to. Yeah. But there's also a lot of interpretation that is, that is um, in, uh, informally happening there. 
So I think maybe it's not about seeing that only as two opposite poles, formal, informal, but it's about finding ways. And then maybe that's, that's a good way of describing also what I try to, um, try to, to, to convey in my talk is to understand that yes, on one hand, we as architects will provide some kind of formal um, structures, structures on everything from physical to non-physical, but we have to accept that this is then interpreted, this is altered through varying degrees of informality. Yeah, And for me, that is what makes cities interesting, what makes life interesting. Yeah, This is why, um, you know, his, historic cities in, in Europe or elsewhere are so interesting to look at, yeah, because they, these are grown over, uh, over, over deck, over centuries, and, you know, they're, they're this informal element of alterations, of changes, of interpretations has kind of like um, taken hold of extras of streets that might at some point been been more planned yeah but now they are they're full of life and that's and and through that i think they're then able to adapt better to any form of crisis whether it's a small scale or a larger one um rather than closed systems perfect buildings perfect cities yeah thank you florian who's is it yes yeah, thank you, Maria. Yeah. Uh, will be last question or probably comments from Vijay, yeah? He is the alumni of Petra and also alumni of Sheffield. <laughs> Hi, Florian. It's great. Hi, you. Uh, great to see Good you. Good to again. see you. Yeah. Same Wonderful. here. Excellent. Uh, Good. It's really, it's really nice to listen to your uh, lecture and it's really it's really um, very, very, uh, uh, very useful for 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 all of us, for especially for the student uh, from from uh, they're working on like a urban design studio, right? Yeah, Guru Lia, urban design studio. So um, I, I have like simple question, but before before that, I think it's really important for from what Florian already taught, taught us that. Uh, it's very important for the student to understand that uh, even simple, simple, simple adaptation, a uh, small adapt scale adaptation, it, it can can be it can be categorized as an urban design project because some of us, as mostly most of us, talk, uh, think that urban design project is all about master planning, is all about big scale or huge scale of project. So this is what I learned from you also, Florian, when 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 I was in Sheffield. And um, my, uh, it's, it's it's really great to understand this uh, from uh, from from a diff different point of view, especially, especially from you from from UK. And uh, like uh, like I said, like I always like I always thought that uh, uh, what I learned in UK, what I learned from Sheffield, what I learned from you is very very um, applicable in Indonesia. That's why. Uh, small scale intervention, small scale adaptation is 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 really is really uh, have a high high impact in 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 developing country like us in Indonesia. Uh, and my question is, I have, uh, I have this question is, uh, uh, what do you think uh, about this small intervention, small adaptation uh, regarding the urban sprawl? Because we live in Indonesia, uh, uh, different to European country, which it's difficult to uh, to this, for for the city to expand uh, to to the uh, for the area wise. But in Indonesia, we still have a lot of uh, plot. We still have a lot of land. So uh, if this is this not uh, yeah, uh, we understand that government tried to. Um, uh, make this like regulation to control the spread to control the spread, but uh, but uh, from from what I understand that it's not it's not the answer it's not the right 
it's not the I mean it's not effectively a good solution for for the city to grow just because just by the regulation so what do you think uh, about this small interference small adaptation uh, implementation regarding the urban sprawl urban urban sprawl in Indonesia Well, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one. I, I think, yes, on, on, one, on, on one hand, uh, I, I think urban sprawl is not a very clever thing uh, in, when it comes to cities. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, just simply because it's a waste of resources, it's, uh, it's pre premeditating the use of cars, um, it kind of, uh, you know, stretches out uh, valuable infrastructure. Mm. Um, all these kind of these elements um, are, um, are problematic. It it also breaks up social cohesion. I think um, so. So there are there, there there's there's all that. But I mean, but still, um, I guess the 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 problem with the urban sprawl might be that 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 the more space you have as individual because your house and there's a plot of land around it as well yeah the more you already can like have created that separation between your private life yeah your private house and and the public life which is the street yeah so um a lot of these um adaptations that i showed earlier actually happened in that transition mm. between the private and the public yeah um and it it to a certain degree it was bringing the public in you know you you transformed the ground floor flats into shops or you are you're extending into the public realm with your illegal little garden because they want to have a bit of greenery yeah or your you yeah whatever so um it's this um negotiation that happens yeah through these little adaptations and i guess the more you go into into the urban sprawl and that's in the suburbs here in germany but i guess the same like in i don't know the sprawl in in, uh, in surabaya yeah? but the the sprawl the more space you you if, if you have already that boundary yeah between the private property and the house and then the street then it's very difficult to to work with this threshold I, I guess so that's that's one one level so the question would be you know how can we maybe introduce typologies or elements in that zone between the public realm and the and the private realm that allow for um at least at some points, you know, for 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 for, for, for this interchange to happen. Um, but I also think it's it's really depending on this question of um, uh, what are services that are missing, maybe in these sprawls. You know, how can how, how can that be, be be brought back in? I, I'm as you can see, I'm reluctant to to give a give a more <laughs> definite answer just because I'm. Um, I feel I, I know I know something about the kampongs through Ruli's work and through your work uh, that you've been doing in Sheffield. So um, I'm familiar with that, but I'm not familiar enough with with the sprawl situation in Indonesia uh, to give you now an answer without without sounding too stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. We are really running out of time. Thank you very much, Florian. Um, last session will be the photo session. Bram will arrange okay. the photo session. Please, Bram. Photos. Please, okay. students, turn on your camera. We have here also okay. the senior lecturer from Petra. We have here Pak B, Pak Dani, Bufina. 
and all master student buyayas, undergraduate student also. Okay, Bram, sorry, <laughs> interrupt you. <laughs> no, it's okay. We are waiting for students and attendees to open up their How do, you, how do you get 100 people on the screen? <laughs> uh, there's uh, an application, Ooh. Florian. It's called Preview. Okay. And it can contain until... Okay. What is 16 oh, times It's so lovely nine. to see you now all. Oh, my gosh. It was, yes, please. I wish we would open have... Your camera. We should have done this at the start of the talk uh, so that I get an idea of all the, the lovely people who are listening to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good to see please you finally. Please give your thumb if you're happy with your with the presentation, students. Give your thumb if you're happy with the presentation. <laughs> Thank give you. Your give your thumbs. Good. Thanks. Okay. Wait, my screen is already full. Okay. No, not yet because there's more who open up their camera yet. Okay. Florian, can you see Talita, Christina, Timothy? Those are raising questions to you. I, I, uh, Timothy, Christina, okay. see. I don't know. I only see one, two, three, four, five, six, about 18. 18. But total we have 102, right? Mm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but, but, but in terms yeah. of the picture, I only see that. But as long as you see them, that's fine. You just yeah. send me the picture then. I'm just standing here and. We'll do, we'll do. <laughs> or sitting here, rather. Okay. I'm going to take the picture in. One, two, and three. Crazy Done. style? Crazy style? Can we? Wait, 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 <laughs> wait. I need, I need, I need, I need things to save my, my print screen. Crazy, crazy style, style yes, you say? Timothy is doing crazy style all the time. <laughs> Wait, I need a media to save it before I can take another photo. Okay. Please count, Ram. Yeah, I'll count. I will follow Timothy. His style is much better than mine. <laughs> Florian, have you been visit Surabaya? Florian? Florian. Sir, yeah. Florian, have you been visit Surabaya? Say again, please. Say again, please. <laughs> have you ever been? Have I ever Surabaya? been to Surabaya? Yep. No. No, no. Then you must visit Buruli. I'd like to. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, um, yeah. But well, I'm, I'm hoping that soon we can. Uh, <laughs> And we show you Kampung and Urban Sprout. <laughs> yeah, I would love to, yeah. Okay, I'll Frizzy take a picture. Style. Yeah, in three. Good. Okay, Frizzy style. And Timmy just straight working yeah. out. <laughs> Timmy, can you show, uh, no. Kumar. Kumar in front of your camera because it's get cut by your names. <laughs> Oh. Okay, yeah, okay, that's good. Very good. <laughs> okay, in one, two, and three. That's it. Okay, wait, so, Gloria, thank wait, you wait. very much. Oh, okay, okay, it's what? not print screen. <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> it's got light and it's not print screen. Okay, you okay. start again, okay? Yeah, I'm again? okay, start again. Bye bye. One, two, and three. Yeah, I'll check it first, okay? <laughs> Let me check. Okay, I got it. I got okay. it. Okay. Can you show us, Bram? Yeah? Good. Oh, okay. Bram will show the Wait. picture to us. 
I'll stop the recording first. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> before it's going to be. <laughs> I know.